be issues for them or something. Okay. Uh, Chris, did you want to save that for the end or do you want to talk to me separately about that? Sure. Let's just save it for the end. I think it might be helpful for everybody to know. Thank you. Okay, great. So uh, welcome everyone. I'm Loretta Garcia. I'm a co-chair of the Contemporary Issues Forum. Uh, we are recording the session. We post our sessions onto YouTube afterwards. Um, we ask everyone to keep your microphone muted so that it won't interrupt the speaker. And if you can place questions into the chat box, we can pull them off at the end after the presentation is over. Um, I just want to mention that the December uh, session will be December 11th, and it will be on pharmaceutical donations to uh, other countries. We have two speakers who are uh, in the pharma industry, and they're going to be discussing the pros and cons of donations of medical equipment and um, uh, medical uh, pharmaceuticals. So um, we look forward to that. And then I'm going to turn it over now to Bruce Davis, and he will introduce today's speaker, Mary Purdy. Hello, everyone. I'm Bruce Davis. I'm co-chair of the River Road Earth Ministry. And it's my great pleasure today to, in, to introduce Mary Purdy. Mary is a registered dietitian nutritionalist with a master's degree in clinical nutrition. She comes to us online all the way from Seattle, Washington. Um, Mary helps people and, um, and organizations discover the power of food to make their lives better. She's a dedicated environmentalist, and she teaches how our, to make healthy food choices that are ecologically friendly and support a sustainable, resilient, and equitable food system. Mary has written two books, Serving the Broccoli Gods and The, Micro, the Microbiome Diet Reset. She hosts a podcast it's called The Nutrition Show, She's given an excellent talk that all of us can watch on, on YouTube. Um, she's a well-known speaker, and I think you will find her presentation informative and fun. I'm looking for it. So welcome, welcome, Mary. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much, Bruce, and hello to everybody. It's my pleasure and honor to be here speaking with you today. As you may see in the chat, there is a link I would love for you all to go to. It's called Mentimeter. And there are a couple of questions that I'd love for you to answer um, as part of kind of a group activity that we will come into community around. Uh, so if you are able to click on that link and answer those questions, that would be fantastic. And I'm going to share my screen so we can actually see the results of those questions that you're answering. Anyone have any questions or any issues with uh, logging into that, that link that I have on the screen there? Okay, so what I am going to do here is share my screen. And the question that I started off by asking you was, what is one of your favorite places in nature? You know, we are here talking about the earth, the planet. I would love to know from your perspective, what's a spot in nature? that you absolutely love. This could be, you know, your grandmother's garden. This could be, and this could be from the past or the present or perhaps the future. Um, or maybe it's a place that you've been to. Maybe it's a place you've dreamed of going to. Can you see my screen here? Um, You're able to see it? Yes, yes. I can okay. see the screen. It's not the same question as in the chat, right? Um, when you go to that, um, you get the question about favorite foods. There should be a couple of, it can be that one as well. There's a couple of different ones. So, um, ah, here we go. So if somebody is able to answer this question here. If, we will if do you click the first link again, it has switched over to the place in nature question. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Heidi. So look at this beautiful, the Capitol <laughs> Crescent trail, the mountains, the beach, winter woods. Wonderful. You're welcome to put in, I believe, two uh, entries if you like as well. Ah, here we go. The Grand Tetons, Creekside, beside a burbling brook. Yes, love that. 
What else do we have here? The ocean, the beach, our yard, something as simple as just the backyard or the front yard. <clears throat> Excellent. I'm going to move on to this next question as well, which some of you may have already started, which is what's a favorite food or a dish that you feel personally connected to or culturally connected to, or perhaps even spiritually connected to? I see someone getting uh, ready for perhaps some holiday food with a little pumpkin pie, rye bread. Oh boy, oh boy, did I become uh, a big fan of rye bread uh, when, when COVID hit. Um, I see sour brat broughten. I'm seeing the Rocky Mountains. Someone likes to consume Rocky Mountains. I'm sure that's coming no, from the earlier question. That was from the earlier one. <laughs> it's all good. I see blueberries. I see squash pie, pasta, popcorn. So many different foods that we feel connected to for a variety of different reasons. And I want to just make sure we are we are grounded in the fact that we are connected to nature and we are also connected to food through family, through culture, through familiarity, through what we have access to, to what we love. Mom's bread. Excellent. Okay. So I am going to um, stop this share here. Any final foods? All right, I'm going to stop this share here and then move along to, obviously, I, I saw vegan ravioli pop up and tofu just popped up as well. So now I'm going to share my other screen here and we will get started with the presentation. So thank you so much for uh, participating and uh, offering some of the, the things that are meaningful for you. I, I want to really emphasize today that this is not just a conversation of me, a one-sided conversation, yammering on at you guys about what I think you should or should not do. That is not my intention at all. This is really a dialogue where I um, I encourage you to participate in the chat, to to throw things in the chat that, that I'm asking you uh, as questions. Um, we learn from each other. We are in community with one another. And so while I may be an expert in these conversations, I certainly don't know everything and I don't know your experience. So your lived experience, your thoughts, your opinions are also valuable. So I just want to la uh, land us and ground us in that opportunity for connection and also for an open-mindedness. So we are talking about a very complex topic. Um, I think Loretta mentioned that this was about vegan diets, and I would say it's not so much about vegan diets as it is about saving the planet with our forks, which can be sort of a simplistic way of thinking about it, but it's kind of a fun title. So, But it really is complex. As you just uh, demonstrated, the connection that we have to food is incredibly personal. It is incredibly emotional. We also have a lot of differing opinions about food, different attitudes, different beliefs about our food and agricultural system. We also have to consider access. We have to consider affordability. We have to consider culture. Then the word sustainability actually can have different meanings for different people, kind of depending on where you are, where you're sitting, what your perspectives are. And ultimately, my, and I can't emphasize this enough, this is less about personal choices necessarily and really about transforming our food system. So how do we change the culture around what it is that we are eating, serving, advocating for uh, all of the above? Where is our sphere of influence as consumers, as eaters, and as individuals living in this society? So uh, this is my little favorite place in nature. This is a, I grew up in New York City, but this is a, a spot in the Berkshires that my family went to during the summer. And so when I feel sad, when I'm feeling down about the state of the world, I just transport to this spot, um, this lupin field, this barn where I spent many, many happy summers um, as a kid and have gone back to as an adult as well. Um, and just such an important part of my life. So let's get on to some of the nitty gritty, which many of you may already be well aware of because maybe some of you are already in the climate reality project, um, no. But we know that uh, we've seen a huge uh, amount of global emissions reaching record levels. We've seen hot uh, hot weather uh, taking, taking hold and extreme weather patterns. I don't know about you all um, where you are, but I imagine you've experienced some extreme weather patterns here in the Seattle area, we had 110 degrees last year, which is completely unheard of in this neck of the woods. People uh, died of, of, of heat related illnesses. We are seeing sea levels rising, soil being degraded, there's biodiversity loss, there's air pollution. And ultimately we know that human influence and impact has been absolutely established and is completely undeniable. 
So you may have heard of the Sustainable Development Goals. I'm not sure if people are familiar with this. These were formed in the 2015 year. And this is a call to action to end poverty, to protect the planet, and to make sure that everybody enjoys a little touch of peace and a little bit of prosperity by 2030, which, if you have not checked your calendar, is coming right down the pike in about seven years. And ultimately, when we think about human well-being, this is not just about eating broccoli, right? Although that's part of it. But human well-being is much, much grander than that. It depends on not only eating broccoli, but also on protecting the environment and on reducing social inequities. And there are 17 sustainable development goals. And really, all of them have something to do with our food system. So let's do a quick reality on the climate crisis right now because the impact is disproportionate. It is affecting lower income communities, elderly people, children, communities of color, indigenous communities, and developing countries. It's a far, far greater um, impact on them. And when people are poor, their ability to bounce back to be resilient um, is diminished and their vulnerability is increased. So right now we are trying to get to uh, no more than a global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius. And if we can do that, which we are not on the path to do right now, um, this can have benefits to people, to ecosystems and ensure that we have a more equitable and sustainable society. So how did I get interested in this? So I've been a dietitian nutritionist since 2008, but I've also been a longtime environmentalist. So for the longest time, I was like, I'm gonna do everything I can. I'm gonna take short showers and I'm gonna drive less. I bought a biodiesel car. I biked, I carpooled, I recycled, I composted, I used less, I bought less, and I advocated for the Green New Deal. And then uh, 2018 hit and it was so smoky here in Seattle that I could not even go outside, I could not breathe. And I was lucky enough that I could work from home some days, but I recognize that there are many people who cannot and who are being affected right here, right now by the climate crisis. And ultimately the climate crisis, you know, as a dietitian, I care about food, right? I care about human being when their wellness, climate change is affecting the quality of our food. It is threatening our food supply. And on the other side, the way that we are producing our food right now is not only harming the environment, but it is driving climate change and for God's sake, it is, or for gosh sake, pardon me, it is producing less healthy food. So we've got a, you know, a trifecta of, of negative consequences of our food system right now. And I thought, I got to do something about this. So here's your first question. Here's your first group participation, aside from the Mentimeter. What percentage of our greenhouse gases comes from our food and agricultural system? This little cat wants to know. So put it in the chat. What do you think? Choose a percentage, any percentage that you think maybe is somewhere in there. I see 20%, I see 45%, I see 30%, I see 15%, 20%, 90%, 45%. Wow, a lot of variation here. Okay, uh, 50%, 30%, 30 Okay, so if we kind of depends on which paper you're reading, who wrote the paper, when they wrote it, what they're all including, but we can safely say that the food and agricultural system is responsible for at least a third of greenhouse gases. So the the, the various different percentages that I've seen in the, in, the, in the amount of research that I've done is 25% to 37%. Some individuals or some theories may put it up even higher than that. But part of this is because of the practices that we use in our food system that inhibit the ability of our soil to store carbon, to take carbon out of the atmosphere and bring it into the soil where it belongs and where it should be staying. Sorry about that, I didn't, I didn't move that slide forward quickly enough there. So what greenhouses come from our food system? What do you think? Again, toss it in the chat. What are the greenhouse gases that come from the food system and agricultural system? I'm seeing methane from Heidi. Who else has got a guess? Methane, carbon, methane. Okay. Anyone else have any guess? Methane and carbon. So nitrous oxide. Great. So let's talk about these. Carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and methane are three of the top um, greenhouse gases from our food system. There are others, but we only have so much time, people. So carbon dioxide, where does that come from? What do you think? Where are we releasing carbon dioxide from our food system?
Anyone have a guess? From the soil, from burning plants. Yeah, so deforestation is the biggest one. Deforestation to grow food, um, usually for animals. The fossil fuels, the machinery, exactly. Tractors, transportation. It is also from the production of agrochemicals, fertilizers and pesticides and plastic. That actually produces greenhouse gases as well. Nitrous oxide, anyone know where that comes from? Fertilizer and some plants, says Evelyn. Fertilizer, yes, so fertilizer is a big one, but it is also coming from the stored waste from livestock, animal agriculture, uh, put in these massive manure lagoons that then um, produce this nitrous oxide. And then methane, where does that come from? Food waste, says Chris. Cattle, yes. So from livestock and from food waste in the landfills, which is the third largest source of methane, also from fossil fuel combustion. Now here's the bad news about methane. It is more, it produces more heat in the atmosphere. Uh, I think about 84 times greater than the carbon dioxide. However, the good news about methane is that it is actually more readily removed from the atmosphere. It has a shorter life in that atmosphere. So there's a tremendous opportunity if we can reduce the amount of methane that's being produced. I think many people get stuck in the carbon tunnel vision, right? They think, oh, you know, carbon, carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, that is the thing we need to focus on when it comes to being more sustainable. But you might see other things here, right? You might see things like, Oh, let's talk about biodiversity loss. Let's talk about poverty. Let's talk about health. Let's talk about inequality. Let's talk about overconsumption. So we have to broaden our understanding of what it means to live sustainably. It's not just about carbon. Additionally, even if Elon Musk or Bill Gates or whoever was able to suck all of the methane and carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide out of the sky, our food system, our global food system, is still having a, a drastic impact, that a negative impact on our environment. It is responsible for a large amount of deforestation, eutrophication, which creates dead zones in uh, our oceans and waters as a result of, of extra nutrients coming from, um, from things like fertilizer uh, that create uh, a, a, an in, uninhabitable area for fish. It's responsible for a huge amount of land use. It's a leading cause of soil erosion, water contamination, biodiversity loss. It's a source of air pollution that's mostly from animal agriculture. It's a loss, it means a loss of habitat for wildlife and people. And the food system itself has been built on systemic racism and, and systems of oppression. So there's many past and current inequities. And all of this has human health, health impacts. Often this is disproportionately affecting marginalized communities, um, people of color, indigenous communities. And the food that we're producing is actually unhealthy, ultra processed and contributing to the very chronic diseases that we are all working to address and avoid and prevent. So not only is this an issue of, of environmental degradation, but this is also an issue of environmental justice as we see the disproportionate impact occurring in, in communities of color and historically oppressed individuals. So what is the food system that I've been talking about? What is the food system? Who would, who would like to, to take a little guess on what the food system, what is this food system that I'm talking about? Y'all came and you're like, what's Mary even saying? What, what is this food system? Anyone have any thoughts? So I see big ag, agriculture, the farm to table processes. Yeah, I want you to think about what you had for breakfast this morning or dinner last night, or maybe you had lunch already. What did it take to get that food from wherever it started to your plate, right? So I'm seeing Chris saying production, consumption of agricultural products. Yeah, so the food system is this food supply chain. It's how we grow or produce, harvest, fish, slaughter, transport, distribute, store food, process, package, prepare, prepare and, 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 and produce uh, food. How do we purchase it? What about marketing, selling, retailing, how we consume it, and ultimately how we unfortunately either discard or waste it. So all of these processes take all kinds of resources. So what are some of the resources that come into play here? What do you think? What resources went into 
the food that you ate this morning or the dinner that you had last night? What resources were utilized to get that food to your plate? What do you think? You could start at the very beginning too. So I see plastics, water, land. Yes. Let's kick it off with just the land, right? How did it, where did it get started? It got started in the land with the soil. We used water. There was energy. There's fuel. There was chemicals. Uh, there was labor, human labor, animal labor, perhaps, and then packaging as well. So, so much of this is it is important for us to consider as we look at the food on our plate. Now, the thing is, we got to understand, hey, we still have to eat. So it's not like we can't use land and water and energy to produce our food. We absolutely must. But the way that we're doing right now is way out of proportion in terms of the effects that it's having on the environment and the climate. So if we think about how these processes affect the environment, our agrochemicals uh, and the methods that we're using damage our soil. Wildlife, pollinators are impacted. Ecosystems have been disrupted. We're creating pollution. And then the packaging and plastics um, have an impact on uh, not just greenhouse gases, but also marine life. We are also affected as well, right? Humans, we are affected by all of these things too. And particularly, again, that marginalized population uh, tends to be more affected um, than those who maybe have a bit more privilege. So what do you think? What does it mean to have a sustainable food system? Again, you throw it in the chat. What does a sustainable food system mean for you in your mind? What does that look like? I'm seeing that Chris says uh, that, that missiles and aircraft also affect wildlife and sea life. Absolutely. I don't know if missiles are a part of the food system necessarily, but aircraft bringing things may also have an impact. So I'm seeing people say it's local. It's about renewable ag. Healthy food that's easily attainable. Yes, these are really important. Plant-based, a system that doesn't deplete the environment is sustainable. Ability to feed everyone. Great, you guys are getting the hang of this, that it's more than just one thing. It's so many different things. So Catherine's saying that what goes out co goes back in. And we're going to build on that concept as well. Because when we think about the word sustainable, and I'm hoping we'll come up with a better word for this, um, and regenerative is one of the things that I think people are using a lot. But do we want to sustain what we have right now? Clearly, it ain't working. So do we want to sustain slash maintain it? No, we really need a transformation. So let's just talk a little bit about how it's unsustainable. As I mentioned, some of this may be a little bit of a repeat, but the agrochemicals have an impact. When we grow just one crop known as a monoculture, that leads to a lack of biodiversity that increases the need for things like pesticides. And right now, the way that we farm actually damages and erodes the soil. So that's things like tilling and plowing, using fertilizer and pesticides, uh, leaving the soil uncovered. And something to note uh, as we begin to talk a little bit about more plant-based foods is things like lentils can actually act as soil building uh, crops that help to fix nitrogen, taking nitrogen out of the air and atmosphere and putting it into the soil with some help from the bacteria in the soil, provided that they're around, um, and helping to uh, bring a more natural fertilization. Legumes, as Catherine's saying in general, yeah, have that have that wonderful nitrogen fixing property. When we don't uh, rotate the crops, that actually uh, has an impact on an increased need for pesticides. So. Certain crops have certain abilities to bring certain predatory pests in that can kill some of the, the pests that we don't want killing our crops. So uh, there's a, a lack of doing this. And ultimately, we are reducing the ability of the soil to sequester the carbon. And as I mentioned, what we're producing is, reduce, is contributing to many chronic diseases. So one thing that's interesting to note is... Um, Take a look at this chart here. Just focus on the right-hand side here. What we are producing and what we are recommending in our dietary guidelines is way out of whack. So the blue is what we are producing. The orange is what we are recommending. So let's start with the top here. How much sugar is recommended in our dietary guidelines? I'll pause for effect here. <laughs> how much is being produced, a whole heck of a lot more than what is being recommended. 
let's float down to the vegetable and fruit category. This is what we are recommending, and this is what we are producing. It's kind of hard to tell somebody to eat more vegetables when those vegetables do not exist. So once again, this is about access, not just about saying we need to eat more vegetables, we need to eat more of these foods. When those foods aren't actually produced, that creates a problem. However, if you look over to the right, in terms of what we are producing, red meat is being produced at a level that is 568% greater than what we are recommending to be consumed. So this is not just about telling people what they should or shouldn't do. This is really where policy and systemic change is necessary. I know some of you are living in the DC area, so you may be able to be more involved with some of the things that are happening in the, the legislature. So sustainable diets. Again, this is more than just eating broccoli. This is more than just one thing as we've begun to discuss right now. So um, it has to consider these four pillars. It has to be healthy and nutritionally dense. It needs to consider the planet and the environment. It needs to be economically beneficial and it needs to look at sociocultural considerations. So what does this mean? We need to have diversity of food, nutrient dense foods that are uncontaminated. Uh, people are not malnourished. Water and air should be uncontaminated. And we need to look at the impact that antibiotic resistance may be having on human health. From an environmental perspective, a sustainable diet or a sustainable food system needs to rely on fewer agrochemicals. We need to make sure we don't have biodiversity loss. We need to make sure that we are supporting the health of the soil, the health of the ocean, that there are fewer greenhouse gases, less food waste, less food loss. And then from an economic point of view, it needs to be profitable to everybody. That includes the farmers, the people who work on the farm, the people who harvest, and the grocery store clerk, right, who's helping you bag your groceries. Are we paying people enough money? And is the food actually affordable? You know, when we think of like, gosh, people think organic food is so expensive. Well, is it that it's expensive or is it that we are not paying people a living wage to be able to afford food that is supportive to the environment and to their health? There's a terrific report that came out from the Rockefeller Foundation that talks about what is the true cost of food. So while you may be buying a hot dog for a dollar, um, what's the true cost of that? It's actually $3. It's three times as much because of the impact it has on health, on biodiversity loss and environmental degradation and greenhouse gases. And then lastly, the sociocultural component. Is the food culturally appropriate? Is it inclusive? Does it honor indigenous communities? Does it support food sovereignty, food agency? Does it support animal welfare, the welfare of farm workers? And what about equity? Is the food system supporting equity, gender equity, racial equity? What impact might it be having on marginalized communities? So I encourage us to branch and broaden our notion of what it means to have a sustainable diet, because it's hard to cover all four of these pillars, but that's the goal that we have to keep in, uh, in consideration. So four areas of focus, if you're looking to be an agent of change, I'm putting out four, there's about a hundred things that we can do, but we only have got, you know, 45 minutes here. So number one is just to reduce meat consumption and increase unprocessed plant protein. And I'm going to put variety um, number two is to support foods that are grown using more organic or regenerative practices, which we'll talk about. Number three is to reduce our food waste. And number four is to reduce single plastics. So let's kick it off. So animal-based foods um, are far more resource intensive than plant-based foods. You can see here, uh, the orange is uh, how we use land. The blue is how much water is being used, and the green is how much land is being used. So you can see here that beef really tops the charts um, comparatively to all of these other foods. Additionally, this percentage is 15% of greenhouse gases come from industrial livestock. That number has actually gone up to 16.5%. So I need to adjust this um, because I just saw a paper um, recently, and that number is now officially 6.5%. So should everybody go vegan? 
it's a complex question, right? If we know that resources are are greater um, in animal-based foods um, and less in plant-based foods, then perhaps people might say, well, everyone should eat be plant-based. Well, I'm going to come back because having been a dietitian for 15 plus years and work with thousands of patients, it is not that simple. It is not that easy. However, just cutting meat by 50% can reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 40%. We have to meet people where they're at, right? Not everybody is prepared to become completely plant-based. I've had people come into my office and say, uh, you're not giving away, you're not taking away my, my, uh, my, my sausage, you're not taking away my coffee, and you're not taking away my chocolate. And I'm like, oh, hi, nice to meet you. Have a seat. My name is Mary Purdy. Um, welcome. So um, we got to think about what they have access to, what is culturally relevant for them, um, what they can afford. Uh, so it really is a, a very nuanced conversation. When we think about fish and agriculture and aquaculture, a lot of wild fish stocks are also fully fished, overfished. This is affecting biodiversity. The feed that's fed to aquaculture fish, pesticides and antibiotics can lead to issues with eutrophication, can contaminate the water and may impact other fish as well. There's an impact on indigenous communities, people who live on the coasts. So things like smaller fish may be more sustainable. Oftentimes they contain more microplastics, but there's a big movement right now called the blue food movement, which is really focusing on encouraging people to eat more bivalves, more mollusks. These are things like your oysters, your clams, your, your, um, your mussels, because they use far fewer resources. Okay. And as I mentioned, people get nervous about this. They're like, don't take away my bacon, okay? Um, so how do we work uh, with this model of knowing that animal agriculture is having a huge impact? And I'm going to say industrial animal agriculture is having a huge impact on our environment and the climate um, and still work with people's dietary preferences and what they're familiar with and what feels culturally important for them. Animal agriculture can also play a positive role. So better meat can be part of a healthier ecosystem. And for many individuals, they feel that this is necessary. So when there are well-managed farms with humane practices, uh, animals that are grass-fed, organic, this has well-being uh, benefits for the animals and for the land, and also for us from a healthy perspective. There used to be a symbiotic relationship that took place between the animals and the land. So people would grow food, they'd grow cover crops, the animals would eat the cover crops, they'd take a nice big old poop on the ground that would nourish the soil with uh, you know, natural fertilizer. Uh, there was crop rotation that helped to make the soil grow and didn't over overtax the, the, the land. So that enables the, the land actually to have water holding capacity, the soil to be healthier. That's important for us as we, as we have more flooding situations. And when that system is healthy, there is a greater habitat that invites wildlife and pollinators, which we know are super important for our food supply as well. And in general, that kind of a system is going to be much more resilient. We also have to think of food sovereignty and of Again, indigenous communities who may be practicing sustainably, humanely, may really be honoring the life of that animal. And it may be about regions. You know, there have been numerous papers that have come out that say, maybe here in the United States, we need to significantly decrease our animal agriculture. But in places that are um, really struggling with things like drought, animal agriculture may actually need to increase because of the potential for nutrient dense foods that certain individuals will, will just simply not survive if they don't have access to that. But for sure here in the States, we need to cut back significantly. So let's get our bean on, right? There's so many ways that we can bring in plant-based foods. I'm just tossing out a few here adding in chilies, bean burgers, lentil soups, black bean soups, hummus, and bean dips. We can add beans to salads um, and combining them. If someone's like, don't take away my bacon. I'm like, okay, great. Let's add, let, let's add bacon as a condiment. You get your flavor of bacon, but it's not the central piece of the meal. We can combine a beef burger with part mushroom. And there's so many health benefits. The fiber, all of the minerals are very beneficial to heart health, to blood sugar balance, and to feeding our gut microbiome, those bacteria in our system and our intestines that really have a huge influence on our system. So what else do you guys think? How else can we get some other um, beans into in, onto the menu or into the diet? What do y'all think?
Anyone have ideas? Any bean or legume lovers out there? Um. Okay, great. So Heidi actually made the three sister soup. Excellent. We got some squash. We got some corn. We got some beans. A plant-based hummus, says Loretta. Fantastic. And, you know, hummus does not necessarily need to always be chickpeas, right? It can be edamame hummus. It could be a black bean hummus. I see curries. Fantastic. Great. Let's move along here so we get to everything. Additionally, you know, if, we, if you're thinking about this from less of just your own plate point of view, there can be things like participating in the Meatless Monday, or there's something called the Cool Food Pledge, which can be part of an organizational uh, effort to reduce meals uh, that are more meat-based. When you go out, every time I go out to a restaurant, I'm like, where are your vegetarian options besides the pasta? And they're like, oh, well, we have, you know, we have a salad. I'm like, where's the protein? Where are the beans on the menu? And then I write a Yelp review saying, hey, I would love to see this, this, this chef, this restaurant be leaders in, in the field here of offering more healthy plant-based options. You can bring these kinds of options to your next party. Um, you know, Thanksgiving is coming up. I'm not sure who is celebrating that, but bringing a plant-based version of, uh, of the Thanksgiving dish can be a great way to introduce this to people. Additionally, if you are a meat eater, Demanding better meat that's been humanely raised, that's part of a farm, uh, that is using symbiotic ways of, 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 of growing and producing food. Consume more mollusks or ask for them again on the menu. Um, let's see here. And then from a policy point of view, there's a wonderful bill or an act right now that's out there called the Healthy Future Students and Earth Act, which is trying to transform our school lunch program to be more plant-based for the sake of equity, uh, for the sake of health, and for the sake of the climate. Great. And I'm seeing someone says, my biggest challenge with beans and other veggie options is the amount of garlic. Uh, let's get garlic out of there. <laughs> and then let's, let's bring in different flavors. Um, or, you know, if you're at a restaurant, just asking them to cut back on the garlic or add in a, a different, a different uh, herb or spice. Great. And we know that what's good for the planet, fortunately, it's good for humans. So there's this wonderful idea of co-benefits. This is the, 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 the upside down a double pyramid where the very foods that we're trying to, and I know the pyramid feels a little archaic and old, old school from the eighties, but this is a, kind of a, a different version of it. This, the foods that we're trying to reduce are the very foods uh, that have a greater environmental footprint. So take a moment. I like to just have us all pause, breathe and reflect. Sometimes this is a lot of information. Sometimes our emotions start to get, you know, going here. So um, just taking a moment. Ah, take a, a, a sip of tea. I'm going to have a little bit of my chai. Okay. Moving along. Um, the school food treaty link again. Yes, it is the uh, Future Students, uh, Future Healthy Students and Earth Act. I'm happy to, to drop that at the end here too. So soil is a big part of this solution. It sequesters carbon, but it plays a huge role in our food system. It provides habitat for creatures. When it's healthy, it's more resilient to drought and flooding. It reduces plant susceptibility to disease and, and pests. It creates nutrient-dense food. It purifies water, and it's absolutely key for biodiversity. Additionally, from a climate change perspective, <laughs> adapt to climate, right? Uh, the climate crisis is already here and we can't fully reverse it. So we need to adapt and we can only do that if we have healthy soil. Regenerative and organic agriculture is working to build health into the soil to help it store carbon. So this is, uh, for thinking about what this is, uh, we are minimizing disturbances to the soil. So that means there's less tilling um, the plants are staying connected to the microorganisms in the ground, this network of bacteria and fungi. There's crop diversity, so they're growing different crops, which feeds the soil, reduces pests. Cover crops is a big part of regenerative and organic agriculture, keeping the soil covered and the ground covered. So the soil uh, continues to have those roots in it that build and sequester carbon from the plants. Um, Rotational crops as well is really key for keeping the roots in the ground, not using chemicals, 
and integrating livestock very often is part of regenerative agriculture as well. And that can be about rotational grazing that stimulates gro uh, growth or using uh, manure as fertilizer. And ultimately these kinds of systems build more resilience into that ecosystem. And lots of research to show that when we grow food in this way, not only is it good for the environment, it is more nutrient dense uh, and that is healthier for humans. So how can we support these regenerative organic farming practices? Number one, shop at your local farmer's market. Get to know your farmer. Ask your farmer, how do you grow your food? Tell me about your chickens. Tell me about this zucchini. Like, how is it grown? If you don't go to a farmer's market or you don't have one, seek out organic labels if that is available to you or pesticide-free or local. Remember, local food isn't always pesticide-free. Local food doesn't guarantee that the farm workers weren't mistreated, but it can be a little bit more of a, of a guarantee that you're supporting your local economy. Diversify your diet. When we don't eat the same things over and over again, we are helping to preserve biodiversity by creating that demand. Support a community garden, join a community garden, join a CSA, which is where you get your vegetables uh, delivered to you or you pick them up and you don't get to decide what they are, but you're supporting a community. Support BIPOC farmers who are very often growing in a way that is more environmentally friendly. And BIPOC is Black, Indigenous, people of color. If you're able to grow your own food, maybe it's just a little plant on your windowsill as a starter. And then advocate for food. Advocate for food in your workplace that has been grown using these practices or at your favorite cafe or at events that you organize. Anyone have other ideas about this? How might you support local or organic or regenerative foods? Any thoughts about this? I see neighborhood composting systems. Yeah, great. We're lucky enough here in Seattle that we have a huge compost um, facility and so we can all compost on a regular basis. Shopping at smaller local grocery stores. Yeah, I will tell you this, Amazon does not need any more money, but that small local mom and pop shop probably does. All right, let's talk about food waste. What percentage, I got another question for you, quiz time, quiz time. What percentage of food is lost or wasted? What do you think? I see 50% from Lisa. I see 40, 40, 40, one third, 40, 40, 25. All right, you're all very on, on, uh, on target here. So about 30 to 40% of food uh, is lost or wasted. And this produces methane gas, which we understand to be very detrimental. Um, and about 8% of our greenhouse gases come from food waste, 8%. Some people might say six, so we can say six to eight. You know, Why is this happening? What do you think? Why is there so much food waste? Who's got a guess? Who's got a theory? And thanks for the information about uh, community composts. So I'm seeing Heidi saying, we refuse to buy the ugly stuff. Loretta says, we're overbuying. Evelyn says, we're just buying too much and then it spoils. Okay, so then we have some uh, laziness, ignorance. <laughs> All right, we're gonna, we're gonna reframe that a little bit, but uh, we're seeing shopping habits. We're seeing hoarding out of fear. Yeah, really interesting. Just think even about what happened during the beginning of COVID where everyone was panicking and buying out the grocery stores. And I'm sure a lot of that food uh, probably went bad, serving too much at dinner. So, so many different reasons, right? Um, it can start with just bad weather or it can start with pandemics. We threw away tons and tons of produce because there was no one out there picking it. Um, and because people were so afraid, there was just, you know, there was no real supply chain that was that was that was holding steady. We overproduce, we overbuy, there's processing issues, there's a lack of planning and label confusion. What does best before mean? Anyone know what best buy dates? Yeah, I'm seeing uh, Catherine saying this. People are afraid of getting sick um, from old food. What is Best Buy? You ever see that on your on your on your food or on a on a on a label on a on something? 
So I will tell you, Best Buy is the date by which the manufacturer of that food thinks that food will taste its best. It is not the date by which you might grow a third ear if you consume that food. So there needs to be education around this, right? People don't, they're not aware of it. So they see that Best Buy and they're like, oh my gosh, November 20th. Well, for gosh sake, this food is going to be bad today. I can't eat it. Um, it really is only applicable to baby formula. So yeah. There's also the fear of the ugly produce. Not everybody wants an, uh, a, a, an eggplant like this that has a Pinocchio nose, right? There's no composting programs and composting is amazing. However, all of the resources that go into creating the food that we talked about are still being utilized even when the food gets composted. So one question for you as well is what percentage is wasted by us at the consumer level? What percentage of food is wasted by us? Anyone have a guess? I see 30%, 25%. 10%, 5%, we're going down, we're going down. Do I hear 1%? Um, actually, it's higher, which is 40% is wasted by people like you and me. Um, and I, I, I am guilty as charged. I had you know, a, 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 a carrot that was basically turned into, I'm not even sure, a science project in the back of my fridge. I, you know, I felt terrible, but this is the reality. So once we get busy, we don't see these things. 40% is wasted by major food producers. So how can we reduce our food waste? Let's brainstorm a little bit. I'm going to offer a few ideas. Um, and food waste is the, is the food that is wasted after it has been brought to, is, it has been harvested. Food loss is the, is the food that is lost along the way before it actually gets to market. Food waste is the waste, the wasted food after it has been brought to market. Thanks, Margaret, for helping me clarify that. So we can just buy less food take less food on the plate. We can bring containers to restaurants. How many do you, restaurants do you see just pouring off massive quantities of food, uh, clearing for people's tables? We can be more mindful of the foods that are in our fridge. Maybe we set a reminder for ourselves to clean out the fridge two days a week or just check the back of the fridge. There's something in there that's still edible. We can get creative. Remember that carrot I told you about perhaps before it becomes you know completely liquid in the back of the fridge, we can drop that carrot into a soup, um, chalk up, uh, chop up the broccoli stalks or the, the kale stems, make that into a frittata or a soup or whatever you like. There's the best buy there. Love up your ugly. And in my mind, there is no ugly produce. Okay. It's all beautiful. All my children are beautiful. Um, so love that up compost. And then there's a policy. If you are interested in policy that is called the zero uh, waste act as well. Any other ideas? Sorry, I didn't uh, move forward here. Yes, I'm seeing Catherine saying, when veggies are approaching their end of life, slice them and freeze them. And this can go for herbs and spices too. Fantastic. Heidi says, store less food so you can see what you have. Great. Or stored in, in, in containers that you can see through can be helpful too. So I, and I'm seeing that Chris says, I tend to buy too many fruits and vegetables and then forget them. Some people have a weekly clean out of their fridge. Fantastic. Yeah. So next up is plastic. The U.S. is the biggest generator of plastic. Six pounds of plastic waste per person um, per year. And only 10% of plastic is actually recycled. So question for you again, I'm big on percentages right now. And Bruce says too, for when it comes to uh, going back to food waste, know what you have before you shop. Excellent. So uh, what percentage of the plastic in landfills is from our food packaging? So there's a lot of plastic uses for a lot of different, a lot of different things from a lot of different sectors, but what percentage comes from our food packages? So we got some variation. I see 5%, I see 60%, 50%, 80%. And the answer is, survey says, 45%. So that's still almost half of the plastic that is coming into our system comes from our food system. This goes into oceans and waterways. It has impacts on uh, marine life, on our health as well. And the production of plastic produces greenhouse gases. Who are the biggest producers of plastic? Anyone want to take a guess? 
<laughs> yeah. What do you think? Yeah, and, and all different kinds of packaging um, <clears throat> can contain different types of plastic. So Loretta says tech, Bruce says oil companies. It's actually Coca-Cola, Unilever, and PepsiCo. Um, that's what we're able to, 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 to find remnants and evidence of. Um, this is some interesting information that I learned, which is that Nestle actually hired door-to-door -door salespeople, this was long ago, to promote their plastic packages as something like, hey, this is easy, this is convenient. And to be, you know, to, to, to visit the other side, plastic helps to reduce food waste, right? So is it all bad? It, it, it may have some benefits, but the amount that we're producing and then the amount that's being thrown away is, is, is really problematic. So who does the onus lie on? Is it us, the consumer, or is it the producer? You know, we, we've been given this sense of like, oh, you should recycle. Why don't you recycle? Um, all of us, says Loretta. Catherine says the producer. Yeah, I mean, it, it's an interesting question, right? Do we, do we request, urge, uh, require all of us to take this burden on? Or does it start at the very production? Why is so much plastic being produced in the first place? So it's, it, the burden is on all of us. So what can we do to reduce our plastic consumption? We can eat foods more in their whole form without the single use plastic. We can buy in bulk. We can just not buy as many single use plastic products, looking for larger versions of things, not individually wrapped. We can reuse, we can look uh, at uh, reusable storage bags. We can store food in glass containers, helpful for the food waste reduction. We can bring our own container to things so that we don't necessarily have to use the container from the, the eatery where we go to. We can bring our silverware, our napkins. Um, these are all things that I have uh, in my bag that I always bring with me wherever I go. Sometimes I forget, I'll be honest, but I do my best. We can cook more. Um, we can reuse and of course recycle. And from a policy perspective, we can ask our reps to support something called the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. So while we can change our habits, we can advocate for others to change their habits. A lot of this has to go down to the policy level. So what ideas do you have? I've seen reusable containers from Loretta. Thank you so much. Anyone else have ideas about how they might reduce their plastic consumption? or reduce plastic consumption in general. Ask for no plastic utensils with takeout. Oh my gosh, yes. I did that recently and they still put them in. I was furious. I actually called them up and I said, I asked for no plastic. I said it nicely, but I did say, I asked for no plastic um, things for me. I'm, I, I, I'm very transparent about this. I'm saying, you know, I'm really trying to reduce plastic consumption. It's so important. So yes, we can get, we can advocate, we can be um, really verbal about this. So barriers, um, we're running out of time here and I wanna make sure there's time for questions, but you know, I might just ask you to think about the idea of what it might mean um, to have challenges and barriers that may make it difficult to make different kinds of choices, dietary choices. And thanks for the additional ideas here. So um, lastly, I just want to say that consumer demand drives change. People are influenced. And we learned about this as climate reality leaders, uh, Bruce Davis and I, that when we just start talking about these issues, that can make a difference. When we educate ourselves, reading more, watching more, listening more, um, that helps as well. Calling our representatives, advocating for more climate-friendly legislation. So many opportunities there. If you're somebody who's on social media, post about it. Respond to others who are posting about it. Write about it. If you've got a local newspaper or an opportunity to write about something, even in the church bulletin, um, take a stand on something right there. Ultimately, if we do not address the emissions that come from food, we cannot meet our goals of reducing emissions and achieving these United Nations development goals sustainable development goals. So I might ask you, what is one thing 
that you can put into play this week? I'd love to hear from folks and then we'll take questions. Anyone have a commitment that they are willing to make this week? It can be simple. I don't care if it's bring my fork to work and instead of using a plastic fork, it all matters. Uh, great. So thank you so much. Chris is saying, I'm going to check my fridge. Awesome. Have no turkey, <laughs> says Loretta. <laughs> Read the Earth Ministry blogs. Fantastic. Replace half meat in recipe with tofu or beans, says Catherine. Fantastic. Great. Um, buy more glass or use more glass instead of plastic. Terrific. Great. There are a couple of ideas here as well. You will have a PDF of the PowerPoint um, that I'm sure Loretta or uh, Bruce will be able to send out to you, but I'm happy to take questions. I know we've got just about five minutes and I'm happy to, um, to entertain any thoughts that you have, but thank you so much. Let's thank our speaker. And then if you wanna post your questions in the chat, uh, Bruce can pull them off that way. Thank you very much, Mary, for this um, instructive and entertaining presentation. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. You're welcome to um, get in touch with me here as well. This is my website. Uh, this is Facebook. If you're on Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, all of those things. I'm not really a Twitter person, but you know, I put it on there anyway. Um, thank you so much, everybody. I'm really happy to take a question or two if you want it even if it's just a personal question or a professional question or, um, yeah. And if not, we can take our leave. Great. Well, thank you so much. Everyone have a wonderful Thanksgiving uh, oh. celebration with family and friends. I do see a couple of questions here, Loretta. If okay, go ask. ahead. Yeah. So it says, does middle-class buying for reduced produce at the grocery store decrease the food available to lower income people? That's a really interesting question. I don't know if I have data on that um, because I think you know that the only reason that that would reduce the, the, the access to, to lower income people, it would be is if that grocery store was like, we're gonna take the leftover produce um, that's not purchased by people and give that to lower income individuals or income communities. But I don't know if that's necessarily the case. I don't know if that, if one, if one leads to the other, what it can do is, is just in general is to drive demand uh, for more organically produced or regeneratively produced or humanely raised um, produce and, and, and food in general. So thanks for that. And I'm seeing Margaret saying, we have met some future farmers of America on the Metro and they do not use or learn organic farming. Has there been outreach to this group? Yes. Thank you for asking that. There is a big movement right now um, called Regenerate America that is specifically designed to help educate and provide resources, financial um, help, incentives uh, to farm more regeneratively. So that is actually something that's happening in the farm bill right now, which is coming out in 2023. So there are people who don't know about it, but there are people who do know about it, but don't have the funds or the 